Hi everyone. I have a little bit of a cold, so my voice might be given out at times. Um, I hope it's not going to be a bother, but I wanted to do it anyways because I haven't done one in a while. And I've also seen the suggestions. And I'm going to be reading the story that was uh, suggested, the SR-71 Blackbird speed check story. But before, I hope you are trying to relax and laying down. And we're going to try and do this breathing exercise that I found um, at the Huberman lab. It's a double inhale and then an exhale. It's supposed to instantly de-stress. So you breathe in until you can't, and then you breathe in a little bit more, and then you breathe out. Let's do it five times. Okay, let's give it a go. The SR-71 Blackbird Speed Check Story by Major Brian Shaw. There were a lot of things we couldn't do in an SR-71, but we were the fastest guys on the block and loved reminding our fellow aviators of this fact. People often asked us because of this fact it was fun to fly the jet. But fun would not be the first word I would use to describe flying this plane. Intense, maybe. Even cerebral. But there was one day in our sled experience when we would have to say that it was pure fun to be the fastest guys out there, at least for a moment. It occurred when Walt and I were flying our final training sortie. We needed 100 hours in the jet to complete our training and attain mission-ready status. Somewhere over Colorado, we had passed the century mark. We had made the turn in Arizona, and the jet was performing flawlessly. My gauges were wired in the front seat, and we were starting to feel pretty good about ourselves, not only because we would soon be flying real missions, but because we had gained a great deal of confidence in the plane in the past 10 months. Ripping across the barren deserts 80,000 feet below us, I could already see the coast of California from the Arizona border. I was, finally, after many humbling months of simulators and study, ahead of the jet. I was beginning to feel a bit sorry for Walter in the back seat. There he was, with no really good views of the incredible sights before us, tasked with monitoring four different radios. This was good practice for him for when he began flying real missions, when a priority transmission from headquarters could be vital. It had been difficult, too, for me to relinquish control over the radios, as during my entire flying career I had controlled my own transmissions. But it was part of the division of duties in this plane, and I had adjusted to it. I still insisted on talking on the radio while we were on the ground, however, 
Walt was so good at many things, but he couldn't match my expertise at sounding smooth on the radios, a skill that had been honed sharply with years in fighter squadrons where the slightest radio miscue was grounds for a beheading. He understood that and allowed me that luxury. Just to get a sense of what Walt had to contend with, I pulled the radio toggle switches and monitored the frequencies along with him. The predominant radio chatter was from Los Angeles Center, far below us, controlling daily traffic in their sector. While they had us on their scope, albeit briefly, we were in uncontrolled airspace and normally would not talk to them unless we needed to descend into that airspace. We listened as the shaky voice of an Ion Cessna pilot asked Sander for a readout of his ground speed. Sander replied, November Charlie 175, I'm showing you at 90 knots on the ground. Now, the thing to understand about Sander controllers was that whether they were talking to a rookie pilot in a Cessna or to Air Force One, they always spoke in the exact same calm, deep, professional tone that made one feel important. I referred to it as the Houston Center voice. I have always felt that after years of seeing documentaries on this country's space program and listening to the calm and distinct voice of the Houston controllers, that all the other controllers since then wanted to sound like that, and that they basically did. And it didn't matter what sector of the country we would be flying in, it always seemed like the same guy was talking. Over the years, that tone of voice had become somewhat of a comforting sound to pilots everywhere. Conversely, over the years, pilots always wanted to ensure that, when transmitting, they sounded like Chuck Yeager, or at least like John Wayne. Better to die than sound bad on the radios. Just moments after the Cessna's inquiry, a twin beach piped upon frequency in a rather superior tone asking for his ground speed. I have you at 125 knots of ground speed. Boy, I thought, the Beechcraft really must think he is dazzling his Cessna brethren. Then, out of the blue, a Navy F-18 pilot out of Nas Lamore came up on frequency. You knew right away it was a Navy jog because he sounded very cool on the radios. Center, Dusty 5-2 ground speed check. Before Center could reply, I'm thinking to myself, hey, Dusty 5-2 has a ground speed indicator in that million dollar cockpit, so why is he asking Center for a readout? Then I got it. Old Dusty here is making sure that every bug smasher from Mount Whitney to the Mojave knows what true speed is. He is the fastest dude in the valley today and he just wants everyone to know how much fun he's having in his new hornet. And the reply, always with that same calm voice with more distinct alliteration than emotion, Dusty 5-2, center, we have you at 6-2-0 on the ground. And I thought to myself, is this a ripe situation or what? As my hand instinctively reached for the mic button, I had to remind myself that Walt was in charge of the radios. Still, I thought, it must be done. In mere seconds, we'll be out of the sector and the opportunity will be lost. That hornet must die and die now. I thought about all of our sim training and how important it was that we developed well as a crew and knew that to jump in on the radios now would destroy the integrity of all that we had worked toward becoming. I was torn. Somewhere, 13 miles above Arizona, there was a pilot screaming inside his space helmet. Then, I heard it. The click of the mic button from the back seat. 
that was the very moment that I knew Walter and I had become a crew. Very professionally and with no emotion, Walter spoke. Los Angeles Center, Aspen 20, can you give us a ground speed check? There was no hesitation and the replay came as if an everyday request. Aspen 2-0, I show you at 1,842 knots across the ground. I think it was the 42 knots that I liked the best. So accurate and proud was Center to deliver that information without hesitation and you just knew he was smiling. But the precise point at which I knew that Walt and I were going to be really good friends for a long time was when he keyed the mic once again to say in his most fighter pilot-like voice, ah, center, much thanks. We're showing closer to 1900 on the money. For a moment, Walter was a god. And we finally heard a little crack in the armor of the Houston center voice when LA came back with, Roger that Aspen, your equipment is probably more accurate than ours. You boys have a good one. It all had lasted for just moments, but in that short, memorable sprint across the Southwest, the Navy had been flamed. All mortal airplanes on Freck were forced to bow before the king of speed, and more importantly, Walter and I had crossed the threshold of being a crew. A fine day's work. We never heard another transmission on that frequency all the way to the coast. For just one day, it truly was fun being the fastest guys out there.